What's up? This is Joshua, MVA Studio, Minneapolis. The beard is out of control. This video that you are about to watch was recorded in my Intro to Typography class. Each week we do an in-class workshop of some kind, and then the following week we look at just a kind of informal slideshow of work relevant to that workshop. So we did a workshop just working with type. So this week we looked at a whole bunch of graphic design or designers who have a kind of extended chunk of work that they've done that is type only or pure typography. Uh, it's nothing groundbreaking, but if you're a student or self-taught, hopefully you'll find a couple things in there that are interesting or inspiring. Uh, the important thing, or what I think is cool, is there is a link in the description that uh, will get you to the PDF that I used for this talk. Every single image and piece of text in that PDF links back to original source material, whether it's projects, interviews, stuff like the Zurich Design Museum archive. It took me hours to find links for every image uh, and I think that's maybe the best part so watch this hopefully you get some insights out of it but then definitely download that PDF and just lose like hours of your life going through the Wolfgang Weingart archive at the Zurich Museum of Design thanks a lot for watching and uh, I don't know you should subscribe I think that'd be a good plan thanks so this is just some of uh, my kind of go-to favorite stuff where it's designers working with just type. A thing to bear in mind, if you haven't heard of these designers, like this isn't the only thing they do. I'm just pulling out those instances where like they did enough work using just type that it's like a thing. Um, but I wouldn't want you running around thinking that some amazing graphic designer only does the five boring things that I enjoyed in this particular presentation. So the first one, Wim Crowell, a legendary Dutch graphic designer who's probably in his 90s and still works to this day. So what Crowell would do is um, he would kind of define different identities for these different cultural institutions that he would work with. But like for the Stiedlich von Abbe Museum in Eindhoven, the system was this all this lowercase gill sans, which is all this, this small type that you see here. And then there's an underlying grade here. And then he would make an illustration, typically, not all the time, but he'd make an illustration that was the name of the exhibition. So on the left, it's like Leger. Then we have the Hiroshima one. This is a little bit later. This is 1960, this is 57, this is 57. His stuff gets kind of colder as time moves on, but this type is like this custom type that's designed off the underlying grid. And you kind of notice there's like a lot of really nice like hard horizontals that kind of cut the plane in half. Because like if you're only gonna use type, you've got to figure out how to make something happen. So for a long time, he did like the big type, like the Hiroshima, and then everything else, that one size, the idea, I will draw you into the plane with the central image, and then you can figure out the details. And then in some, he's not really, he's not doing his hand-drawn kind of technical type, and instead he's looking for tonal things that kind of create a vibe. And then this is his work as it gets into the 60s. Uh, it gets colder and more technical. So uh, the stuff on the left is like a newer turn that the Steedlick Museum takes. He starts to go heavy on the, um, the font in like these three is accidents grotesque. Uh, and instead he's using the type itself to make illustrations of the themes. So the Du Buffet show is a show of prints. So he's mimicking how a lithograph printer works by doing the mirroring and this kind of rolling. This is supposed to, be similar to the cylinder that's in a printing press. He starts getting really technical and super into clean, unmodified typography. And he starts using this universe font, which is like, it's so kind of precise, it's like what this dude needs to breathe. 
And if you can ever find these catalogs and look at them, the detail in them is beautiful. Jacqueline Casey uh, was an American designer who worked at MIT. The stuff that she did that I like the most is very similar in spirit to the Vim Crowell stuff. So like this six poster on the very left, it's uh, for a show <laughs> called Six Artists. So she grabs like a visual anchor, the word six, turns that into an image. And uh, there's a quote from her somewhere, it's very explicitly the idea of make a focal point and then get you to walk up to it and see what it's about. In the work that she does that I think is the best, that's kind of what's happening with this one. This one's kind of amazing because like a lot of her stuff, it's always two sizes. It's like there's big and there's small. This open house is one of the few where it's like a little bit more kind of um, brutalist. It's all the same size. It feels like it's got references to like um, crappy hand painted stuff in the stencil. And like the open house says it's open, but it's broken, but it's also connecting the O's. There's like some nice little stuff happening in there. And then I believe that Generations one, I wanna say, I don't know if she modified the MIT logo or if that's an old MIT logo, but it's such a simple thing. It's about like generations of MIT students. So it's about this like generations of logos. So there's like a concept, but it's not like a, it's not like this deep thing either. It's really more in the execution. Uh, Armin Hoffman is a Swiss graphic designer who's also in his 90s is really one of the people why the idea of Swiss graphic design or Swiss typography, if you know what that is, uh, exists. And so he would do, amongst other things, these posters, um, exhibition posters for the Kunsthal Basel. Um, and his strategy very often was just to take the initials of the artists and then just make a big graphic of that. And again, like that same idea of like, the hope is that you go, what's that? And then you walk up to it and find out like, oh, it's a uh, Willie Baumeister Ernst Ney show. Or oh, Leger Calder. I really love this one. Like this E and the L, so it's so kind of uh, crisp and precise. And then these two get more into a, um, like a formal game that he kind of plays with the type. And again, this is all like, all that type is gonna be handmade. So it's like he finds a structure that references uh, Japanese tea houses, and then like, boom, that's the type. And this other one, it's like good form is like, you know, basically good design. And it's all based on circles and verticals. Um, and it's like this idea of like a perfect kind of design coming from the most elemental pieces. Herb Lubelin, uh, I feel like I may have referenced him today. He is uh, famous for making kind of typography, the star of advertising, probably starting in the 50s, maybe earlier. So it's like he's doing an um, ad for uh, cough syrup. It makes it look like it's coughing. And if you think about, like, if you ever see old advertising, at the time that this stuff is being done, most advertisements, like modern advertisements, are one big photo and three dense c columns of body copy that you're expected to read. And then you have like really hokey advertising, uh, which is like a bunch of hand-drawn uh, like scenes, a lot of copy, a lot of stuff happening. He did this series of ads, which like uh, are pretty brilliant. They have all the body copy, but of course what it really says is, Nitranitol provides safe relief and prolonged action in hypertension. Calentinol for six-way relief of peptic ulcer. Taste for smooth adjustment in the menopause. It's like, that's gonna grab your attention. And then once you see that, you can dig further. I also love the idea of a system that's based on essentially spacing and the technique, but the font is different in all of them. The colors are different in all of them. And it's really about like, it's actually assuming that if someone needed to know of the um, trustworthiness of the brand, they is like assuming a lot of the person reading that ad, um, m way more than anybody working in advertising today would think. Like you wouldn't, I don't even know if you could get away with this. Uh, these are more examples of his stuff. This is the stuff that you may 
like have seen or have seen stuff that looks like it. So what Lubalin did very often, he was obsessed with type um, and made it the star of the show all of the time. His logos are almost never symbols. Like the Cooper Union School of Art and Architecture, like most people are gonna want to turn that into Cooper Union and then convince the school, only say School of Art and Architecture when it's absolutely necessary. Just make the logo Cooper Union or make it CU. He is like, nah, make the whole thing this gigantic, sprawling, amazing logo. Um, and then of course, like here's the logo for his studio. Um, he was a type designer as well. Uh, so he designed these typefaces that did the kinds of things that he wanted to do. Like avant-garde is basically this really aggressive version of Futura that you can still get today. Um, this is, uh, what is this one? That's avant-garde as well. So that's like the lightweight of it. I asked somebody if, they, if something was in Lubel and Graph. That's a serif typeface that he designed that um, again, like they all have these beautiful interlocking parts. And uh, if you can see a better version of this No More War poster, this version I found sucks and I, I shouldn't have used it. You kind of see the really thin lines running through here. But when you see a better scan of it, you just see nothing but these lines and the whole thing kind of shakes a little bit, which is really nice. Oh. And then this is a very famous piece of his. So you know that thing where you see uh, a field of type and it's all in different fonts, interlocking at different angles? That is his invention. Uh, this was for the CBS um, cafeteria was what this was commissioned for. And now I think it lives at the Parsons School of Design. Reed Miles is the guy who basically single-handedly defined the aesthetic of jazz. Before Reed Miles, all jazz records look the same. They look like classical records, and they're really pedestrian looking. Um, and Reed Miles comes along and does all these things. He does like 500 records in a super, super short period of time, hates jazz music, oddly enough, and gets paid $50 to cover, and then produces this body of work that like all jazz records just look like crappy versions of Reed Miles stuff. Um, so these are some examples of him just working with type. Sometimes it's kind of conceptual, sometimes it's about the feeling. Like this feels like right now, obviously that's up. Us three, it's like, okay, cool. There's the three as a focal point, and then this like cropped out set of numbers. And then this whole set is, oh, is really great because it's all driven by the type, but then each one of them, he sneaks in a photo of the artist to where it's like, it doesn't need the photo of the artist, but it's like icing on the cake. Like, um, like especially the Let Freedom Ring one is pretty amazing. I love the in and out one as well, where it's hidden in the, the dot on the eye. Um, and then he's constantly, you can tell he was doing a lot of work and was excited about it, because he's trying so much different stuff on every single one. You know, like super clean, customized Futura over here. This like, uh, I wanna say that's Baskerville on this one. And then over here, he's taking type and literally cutting it up so that it can overlap cleanly. Wolfgang Weingart, another guy that's probably 90. Um, what Weingart is known for is uh, this obsessive experimentation with type going back to the 50s. And then what he did was basically experiment for decades. So one of his like kind of big things, and this is all letterpress type. So this is all done with metal type and bits and pieces of metal, uh, was experiment with the idea of typesetting with metal type. And then the other thing that he experimented heavily with was articulating the structures around the type. So typesetting and then where there isn't negative space, just drawing into it with sort of lines and shapes and whatnot and making this like very machine age work like this. Like this would be a hassle to do today. Like the amount of detail and the amount of attention, like we could do it, but it would be a hassle and you'd have to be pretty obsessive. The idea of doing this in a letterpress print shop um, with like 
pieces of plastic and all kinds of crap that he was doing is pretty impressive. And he explored so wide, wide, widely. So you have like this stuff over here that's very technical. And then the other thing was that he was relentlessly experimenting with just letters and what they could do and how they could do them. I highly recommend like just going down a Google image search on him alone because like the stuff he was doing, he was like using typewriters, then photographing the output and then like seeing how far could he blur it before it wasn't readable, stuff like that. Very kind of uh, adventurous character. Emil Ruder. Ruder wrote this book, which is the best book on typography ever. Um, a pretty much, Armin Hoffman does not define the idea of Swiss graphic design and Ruder defined the idea of Swiss typography. Again, all letterpress. Um, he was really obsessed with like solving an idea in the simplest of means. So it's like something at, like about Berlin and the city. Okay, big tall type. And then it's like it's all custom drawn so that he can like maximize the kind of negative space happening between them. This one is not type only, but I want to say it says understanding photography. So it's just a half tone of a photo, but he drew the half tone because he's a lunatic too. Um, and then throughout 1965, he did this series of covers for. Uh, Typographisch Monitz Blattner, which was this um, Swiss printing magazine that like published a lot of kind of avant-garde modernist design. But the typeface universe had just come out and Swiss designers were obsessed with the gradations in it. And he just did this series of covers just exploring what he could do with those gradations like and just like the textures that he could make, which is kind of amazing because if you look at like the Beckman poster, and the Berlin poster, they're so flat and kind of constructivist. And then when he started to do this stuff, there's like, starts to be like a, a sensuousness to it, um, which is kind of intriguing. And then there's just like, I just love the little bit of like that detail in these things. So this is like a really great example of just like, you have your type and just kind of seeing what it wants to do. Um, and then of course, picking a good font. Finally, a designer that is not 80. Non-format, one partner works out of Norway, the other partner works out of St. Paul, actually. They have done type-driven work since like 2000. That thing, the state of song, I wanna say that's probably from 2002, 2003. So when we started to see all this type with stuff growing out of it, that was non-format's fault. They like created that trend more or less single-handedly. So they used to use normal typefaces out of the box and then they would modify them through photography or effects. And then they started making their own typefaces that became kind of like the main image that they didn't even have to do anything special with. Just make an amazing typeface and then use it as big as possible. But even as they're doing that, they're using out of the box kind of typefaces to create texture. So like the idea that you've made this big, beautiful, kind of crazy font and then you've got your kind of almost monospaced thing that you just filled with like a, a field of uh, asterisks. It's pretty interesting. And then this shows more of the period where they were just all about making their own fonts and everything was like copywriting the font as big as it could be. This was a series of record covers for um, Loaf. So each one had this bag with a CD and a print in it from a different artist. And then their system was just like, use this font as big as it can go, screen printed over everything. And then this is, so this is like mid thousands. This is them in like the last two years. They are like drawing these insane fonts. Um, so this is like a cover of Dracula. This is a, some kind of fellowship program. This is like a music festival. And then these are the divider pages in the, in the artist book recently. All of this kind of incredible custom typography that's kind of like a, a crazy version of Baskerville. Uh, Practice for Everyday Life is a studio from the UK. I just have one page of their stuff. This is pretty old, but the thing I like about their stuff is like these two pieces, they're super plain, 
And then like they always just kind of find like a thing that it's evocative of. So like they make a movie poster type thing, they just kind of make almost a movie marquee bit of typography. And then after that, they're very much like just the facts. Um, this uh, identity system for modern art Oxford is pretty amazing. It's just these giant crops of M modern A art. So this is the back of the letterhead. So this little shot here, you see like the front sheet and then the, you know, like it's hard to get a client to give you enough of a budget to do one second sheet for letterhead. Never mind that they give you enough of a budget to do two second sheets as of like a very forgiving client. Um, so they make do with a lot. Nicholas Troxler has been designing jazz posters since probably 1958 and still like produces the same volume today. So, and his stuff is all over the place. Like here's stuff that uses basically out of the box typefaces the jazz one is from like 1959, and then this stuff runs through. This is from uh, 2010. Um, so he just like relentlessly experiments with stuff. So these are just like out of the box fonts. And then these ones are like this was Futura, kind of. It's this crazy layering. This is just entirely made of dots. And this one, it looks like you've got like universe bold condensed it set in this kind of fun way with just a pattern behind it and then you have stuff like making type with paint making type with cut paper making type out of bubbles like his website is just this pretty insane index of strategies for making stuff um that's really even if, like i hate half of it but it's super inspiring like half of it offends my aesthetic sensibilities but, uh, but the fact that he has half of it that I hate makes me like him that much more. Uh, Joseph Mueller Brockman, another kind of architect of Swiss typography. These are these things where like he's working very minimally uh, and then basically uses the structure of the information and kind of explores what it can do. And this one, it's like, it's just about the, the breaks. Igor Stravinsky, Variations in Memoriam, Aldous Huxley. And there's just this little system of like a break between stuff and then the date. And then it's all built on a grid and then the color helps it suddenly seem like, the color and the fact that it's all lowercase gives it a little bit of like softness that um, for a thing that could really easily be cold and technical. I, I love this one where it just creates a space inside of here just by kind of articulating lines around things and still being um, super kind of uh, crisp. And then my favorite stuff is when he just makes the most boring stuff in the world. Like three panels to separate the name of the um, institution from their performances. This one has like always been one of my favorite things. It's got basically two layers of hierarchy, oops, so it's like each of these is a day of this festival, but my favorite detail is this right here. That's the theater, that's the director of the festival. So like he basically goes like, okay, here's the festival. Here's the dude who put it all together in this way that's like subtle, but it's there. I think like there's something really, really nice about like uh, calling out things differently and, and then like finding a way to kind of pay homage to something while still making this oddly uh, boring thing. I mean, I love this system. A box inside of a rectangle, like institution performances. And then Rosemary Tissy, uh, another Swiss graphic designer. She's part of a studio called Odermatt and Tissy. They do still heavily typographic, almost painterly work. This is a piece of wrapping paper that even that feels very like type only, but this is the thing she did as a student that is one of my favorite pieces of graphic design ever. It's a two day craft festival. So the visual anchor is just the dates, 27th and 28th. And then um, sort of just like pulling together like this bit of a hierarchy. And then I love this gesture. I don't know why I love it so much where like the poster continues and you have this white 
and black. That demarcates the grid. And the biggest thing here is like big and small works. Like always go bigger and always go smaller. Just doing that alone makes 90% of your decisions almost irrelevant. Cause like too often we're like, okay, this thing's 18 and this thing's 12. And it should be like, nah, this thing should be 80 and that should be eight. Uh, and then David Carson, uh, it's oddly hard to Google these days. In the 90s, he was really famous for like kind of throwing away the rule book of graphic design uh, and operating very much by the idea of like how do things feel. So this Nike ad has some maybe roots in the work of Herb Lublin, except that Lublin stuff was very often about an internal logic or a concept of some kind. With um, Carson, it was just about the idea of an attitude. It's just a gesture. Like, like maybe you could post-rationalize and be like, well, it's a shoe. It says something about Andre Agassi. Is it about a tennis ball? But you're never gonna like get to a kind of truth there where you're like, oh yeah, it's obviously about tennis. Uh, it was very much just about like feeling his way through everything. Sunglasses ad, it's just a form that's supposed to grab your attention and communicate a feeling. Um, and he was like, a lot of glitch and random crap winds up in his stuff. Back when there was such a thing as a book industry, this book sold 150,000 copies in a year, which is like unheard of. And a lot of times, like when there's a page that looks white, I'm trying to see if I can find a good example of it, there's just random shit in the background, like he scanned dust or something, which was extremely refreshing and is probably why he ended up being like one of the most famous graphic designers ever, and even to an extent still is. But I love, like this set of posters, those three, I think are probably some of my favorite graphic design ever, especially that green one. There's no rhyme or reason. It's purely this kind of painterly approach to stuff. There are no kind of clean lines and the shapes around everything are like detritus. It's like you scanned like, but who knows? It's like a photocopy of some crap, but then he got rid of whatever he photocopied. Fascinating character. That is it.